to this routinely claim that they aren't and that you should be swayed by authority. Science allegedly progresses through empirical methods, not by having the masses of intellectuals gawk at the doctrines dictated by Nobel laureates. However, in day-to-day -day operations, things are quite different. You will recognize a relativist because he either asks you for your credentials or volunteers his without you asking. In one debate, a science writer, John Horgan, argues that quantum mechanics and relativity shattered our common sense notions about how the world works. Stanford relativist and string theorist Leonard Susskind instantly lashes out at Horgan. Who's common sense? John Horgan's admittedly a non-scientist, I presume. Instead of dyspeptically railing against what he plainly does not understand, Horgan would do better to take a few courses in algebra, calculus, quantum mechanics, and string theory. Susskind has a right to be upset. It took him many years of hard labor to obtain his degree, and today he holds the impressive title of Felix Bloch, Professor of Theoretical Physics at Stanford University. Susskind argues that you need a PhD to understand science and physics. Modern science is difficult and often counterintuitive. That's funny. Two Nobel Prize winners who certainly outrank Susskind on the authority scale say exactly the opposite. If you can't explain it to a six-year-old, you really don't understand it. If you can't explain it simply, you don't understand it well enough. It should be possible to explain the laws of physics to a barmaid. Indeed. What explanations do experts like Susskind offer after 3,000 years of mathematical physics and 100 years of Nobel Prizes? Magical black holes, particles that carry forces, surrealistic warp space, negative momentum gravity, supernatural virtual particles? Do such physical interpretations even belong in science? But Susskind not only has trouble explaining his complex mathematical theory to barmaids and six-year-olds, he confirms what Horgan just finished arguing, that the physical interpretations offered by modern science are irrational. Where intuition and common sense failed, they had to create new forms of intuition, mainly through the use of abstract mathematics. When common sense fails, uncommon sense must be created. Of course, we must use common sense sensibly. Warp space, virtual photons, time travel, and black holes not only offend John Horgan's intuition, but our collective common sense. I mean of everyone on the planet. You don't need a college degree to realize that the scholars are feeding fantastic explanations to the public. When Einstein began to publish his theories back in 1905, he was just an anonymous patent clerk. Would Susskind have asked him for his credentials when Einstein came up with special and general relativity? I recently engaged in a debate with a prominent philosopher of science. This scholar has been to every conference since Newton and has so many medals that would make Susskind eat his heart out. I asked this expert whether space is really warped. You know. Like under Mercury's belly out there? Cambridge professor Stephen Hawking, a renowned authority on relativity, tells us in a straightforward manner that the physical warpage of space has been measured in the lab. Hawking talks about warp space in the context of physical objects and not in the context of mathematical abstractions. Yet when I confront this expert with the official version, he dismisses it as a straw man. Warping is just a popular manner of speaking. The Riemann tensor and its contracted forms, Ricci tensor and curvature scalar, are perfectly well-defined mathematical objects. You won't need to resort to such metaphors. Warping becomes a perfectly reasonable and clear way of referring to something. So let's look at the key words this expert is using to make his case for the euphemism known in mathematics as warping. A tensor is a function. A Ricci tensor is a measure of volume distortion. A volume is not an object, but a dynamic concept. A scalar is a variable. Tensors and scalars are mathematical objects, a euphemism the mathematicians invented to refer to abstract concepts. The only reason they invoke the word object is to insinuate that they are alluding to a physical object and that their dissertation has something to do with physics. The mathematicians have incongruously morphed abstract concepts such as functions and variables into physical objects. Then they qualify these pseudo-objects with physical adjectives such as warping. 
So I clarified to the scholar that everyone, including Hawking, believes that space is really warped out there under Mercury's belly, and not just in a metaphorical or mathematical sense. This is the physical interpretation that relativity offers for gravity. He replies, Why should one bother about the peasants out there? If they are honest with themselves, they should acknowledge forthwith that they are not understanding a single word of such explanations. What about NASA's Gravity Probe B illustrations showing warp space out there? An old and proven method to get ignorant people to pay for a wizard's upkeep is to clad the wizard's thoughts in unintelligible words. Now he does have a point here. Hawking himself describes how the mathematicians mess around with the ignorant peasants in Congress. No government agency could afford to be seen to be spending public money on anything as well as time travel. Instead, one has to use technical terms like closed time-like curves, which are code for time travel. So after searching for the holy grail up the mountain of relativity, you discover that there is nothing at the top. Warp space is just a handy euphemism that gods rely on to make esoteric concepts understandable to mortals. But then if the space out there under Mercury's belly is not really warped, if all this space warp talk is just a grand mathematical euphemism, then we have not answered the question. What physical entity really comes in contact with our tiny neighbor out there and causes its perihelion to shift? What do we find at the end of the yellow brick road? Irrelevant to the caveman's quest for causes. Another expert does a better job of summarizing the startling notion of science the establishment lives with today. Science doesn't answer why questions, it only answers how questions. Science doesn't explain, science describes. Of course, if the official view is that science is merely about describing and physics is about equations, then the entire scientific establishment has lost its way. You don't need to be a genius to describe that light is fast. Science is about explaining why light travels so fast. So what does a fellow who doesn't believe in wave packets and warp space have to do? What if you are one of those few unfortunate individuals who can't see the emperor's new clothes? The first thing that a mainstreamer tells you is to go out there and published through a peer-reviewed journal. Well, that's easier said than done. Imagine submitting a manuscript arguing against the existence of God to a peer-reviewed inquisition board comprised of three Christians, two Muslims, and a Buddhist. What do you think are your chances of being published? Now imagine submitting an illustrated theory of light and gravity to a secret panel comprised of three relativists, two mechanics, and one string theorist. The editors of mainstream journals want to see complex equations and not kindergarten pictures of a theory that goes against their beliefs. But you have to agree that if you can stop light with your hand and generate a shadow, light is three-dimensional. So if I ask you to draw a picture of a chair, would you scribble an equation? You will never again see a picture of light in a scientific journal as long as the mathematicians believe that it is impossible to visualize light and that this is a philosophical issue. So the most incongruous situation has arisen that in order to propose a new idea, you must publish through YouTube. Schwinger had predicted that this is what the peer review system would lead to. The replacement of impartial reviewing by censorship will be the death of science. The bottom line is that the scientific publishing world has worked its way to a catch-22 situation. The editors want to publish exciting, thought-provoking material that will blow you away. Yet they will accept nothing less than relativity and quantum as foundations, despite that relativity and quantum are known to be incompatible with each other. In the coming videos, I will present new hypotheses for light, the atom, and gravity that escaped the scholars of the last 400 years. I am not saying that you should bow down to my version. I am saying that you have a right to hear a different version of light and gravity that doesn't involve supernatural wave packets or surrealistic warp space. I am saying that you should make up your own mind and not have the relativistic editors of mainstream journals and people like Leonard Susskind make up their minds for you.